Hello and welcome my partners in crime and as always I say that in the nicest possible way. Now today's true crime, another solved crime, probably more than solved and you'll see that towards the end of it. It's the Casanova killer, the John Paul Knowles um, serial killer or spree killer because he'd done his crimes in such a, at such a fast pace but he is really a serial killer and he is an American serial killer. Now Knowles was born in Orlando, Florida. Um, now, there's not so much on his background, but his father did give him up to live with foster parents. And um, also then he went into like reformatories and sort of stuff like that um, because he was convicted of petty crimes. Now that's sort of what he says why his father gave him up. So you don't really know, do you? Because this man ended up being such a serial killer, really. I think there was probably more about it than that. I think to someone to give their child up, um, you know, I think he was about 19, I think, um, when he was first incarcerated. So as a sort of a young youngster being given up by your father because of petty crime and stuff. I think there was probably more to it than that. But um, in them days, they didn't really speak much about it, did he? But anyway, the father gave him up. He was in and out of um, different places, different foster care homes. He was also in and out of like reformatories for you know young um, adolescents. And that until in the end, that he was actually um, incarcerated uh, at the age of 19. And also he spent many of this next few years more time in prison than he did out. So he was a criminal anyway. Um, he used to steal things because he just did. That's what he wanted. If he wanted something, he would take it. Um, and I think with him, I don't know if the killings were because people got in his way or he just didn't want to be caught or because he actually liked to kill. I think when we look at the variety of victims that he killed, the age group, men and women, and, and stuff. I think he enjoyed the kill. I think he was a true serial killer in the true sense of the word really. Spree killer yes because he'd done it paced out quite fast paced <clears throat> over a few months but that's only because I don't think we knew or we do know anything about Knowles's past before that. What else did he do? Because he's, I think he's, he was actually um, tied to around 20 murders. But it's assumed and he suggested that it's up to about 35 people. D did he mean earlier on? Was he always a serial killer? It's very difficult to know with this one. So anyway, he was born in Orlando, Florida and his father gave him up and everything else and he moved on and he went on in and out of prisons. And in 1974, um, he was serving a sentence in um, Rainford Prison in Florida. And I think this Rainford Prison is now um, Florida State Prison. Um, it's changed its name and stuff like that. He then, when he was in there, he started correspondence with this divorcee. Um, and she was from San Francisco and her name was Angela um, Kovic. And she, she actually used to go and visit him. The first time that she visited him in this state, you know, Florida State Prison, he proposed to her and she accepted, just like that. Now he was in prison, wasn't he, for petty crimes and stuff. Robberies and stuff like that, stealing cars, breaking into houses. This is what his early um, criminality was about or what he was actually caught for. He wasn't up for murders and stuff like that. So with a lot of prisoners and a lot of people, men and women, write to prisoners, um, you know, and um, some are serial killers. And a lot of people do write to them and start relationships with them and, and, and things like that within prisons. Um, but this man at that time, Knowles, wasn't charged with any of them sort of crimes. So this Angela Kovic, she, when she went there, of course he asked her, the minute he saw her, and don't forget, it was only done by correspondence up until that first time of meeting, he proposed and she accepted, and that was it. What then she did was, 
she then helped pay his legal fees to try and fight these charges and get him get him out so that when he got out and they could form this marriage bond get married live happily ever after and that's how i think she thought it was going to be and actually angela she lived in california so after paying these bills and everything else he finally then was released out. He got his counsel paid and everything. And of course, when you get a good lawyer, you're going to get off. He got out. And then, of course, he's traveled then from Florida to California to be with Angela. But what happened was Angela believed in psychics. She believed in that sort of thing. And many people do believe in that sort of thing. And she went to one just before, actually, or just after he arrived in California to be with her. And she went for this psychic reading. The psychic warned her, you have entered into a dangerous relationship with a very dangerous man. Now, luckily for Angela, she believed the psychic. She believed her. And so, of course, when then she returned home, she broke off her engagement with Knowles. Um, I think he was really upset by that i mean he was a very good looking charismatic man he he was um and we saw i think robert redford sort of look like or a mixture of a couple of movie stars not your typical um how people would imagine a serial killer to be really but he was so i think he's always never been rejected so much by women as um this but he couldn't handle rejection. As with most killers, they can't handle the rejection. And he, it's actually suggested that after she broke off with this engagement on that evening, that he went out and killed three women in this area. So although it's never really been verified, that after this, what I would say, I think Knowles felt re this rejection from Angela um, he went on the streets of San Francisco and again I've said this is not verified because one there's lots of missing people and they assume he was around at the same time and to tell you the truth he can't remember everyone that he killed but they reckon it's one of the 35 that he's talking about and he killed three women on the streets of San Francisco really straight after Angela broke off the relationship with him that night so I know, I mean, he just does speak about, or he did, I think, that he was devastated by this rejection. As I said before, I don't think anyone likes rejection, but most of us, when we are rejected, we may feel a bit down, and we may feel a bit, you know, you know, <laughs> what's wrong with me sort of thing. But um, for Knowles, he went out and killed his frustration his rejection, he's going to take it out on somebody else. And he took it out on quite a lot of people. So after that, he then returns back to Jacksonville in Florida. I think there was a big fight in a bar in Jacksonville in Florida. And he was arrested then for, um, I think, stabbing a bartender. Um, you know, and he was thrown, you know, there was a big fight and then he was thrown in the detention centre, really. Uh, but... The thing is, I think, with Knowles, is when you read about him. I mean, you know, then people that, you, you, you know, escape artists. He could have been an escape artist. Because when they threw him in this um, cell, um, detention cell, because of this fight and it stabbed someone, a bartender, he actually escaped from there. He picked the lock. And he got out. Because don't forget his early days in criminality was theft, burglary, home invasion. And so he picked locks. And he picked the lock on this cell. And literally, he walked out of jail. And, I mean, this is the sort of man you're talking about here. Very clever man, really, to break out of this cell. Because there's no way that this man wanted to be locked up. That was never, ever going to happen. I don't think he could stand it. I don't know whether there was anything like ADHD or anything else that was wrong with him because he seemed to not be able to concentrate. He seemed to not be able to um, stand in close places. He needed to be on the go. 
that doesn't make you a murderer but it may have had something else to do with his behaviour as a child and leading up into different things as well as probably a multitude of other stuff that's going on with this man but you see to be a serial killer you can just be a psychopath can't you and on top of all that the thing is with Knowles when he wanted something he took it and if you got in his way he would kill you and then if you try to catch him and keep him behind bars lock him up I mean to escape <laughs> from the detention centre and walk out I mean the man's got some front or he did her and I think this is when his murder spree really took off now he seemed to have nothing to lose I think his fear of going into prison or being locked up was overwhelming but as I said we don't know if he killed before anyway but this is when we know about or when it is you know detailed about his spree of killings um, so on the night that he escaped actually he broke into a home of a 65 year old woman called Alan, Alice Curtis uh, he bound and gagged her he ransacked her home and took money and valuables and stuff and he stole her car now he didn't do anything apart from tie Alice up but what he did um, <laughs> she choked to death on the gag so he didn't care how he left you he didn't care whether you could breathe with this gag in your mouth they're talking about a 65 year old woman here probably in shock this gag would have been very very tight because there's, he's just escaped from prison there's no way that this man is going to go back in and um, poor Alice died um, from the gag that he placed on her so um, I think on the street where he abandoned the car um, he also then on the same night he recognised um, Lillian and Millet Anderson now they were acquaintances of a friend of his they were acquaintances and these were their children and I think um, Lily was seven and the other little one was uh, no Lily was 11 Lillian was 11 and the other little one was only seven years old now he says the reason he killed them was he didn't want to be identified he didn't want to do it so he kidnapped them and then uh, he strangled them both and he buried their bodies in a nearby swamp now these were kids he knew you know even though acquaintances of the father he knew these children this is an 11 and a 7 year old so we've gagged a woman now of 65 because of the home invasion and we don't know whether he'd done that gag so tight to kill her slowly because it would have been slow it would have been slowly it's not it takes a long time to choke someone anyway and it takes even a longer time to choke on a gag it must have been an awful death for her and then we have an 11 year old and a 7 year old that he says that he's abducted um, at that time he hasn't said that he's done anything sexually towards these children at all but he did strangle them and he threw their bodies in the swamp as if they were nothing because they, he didn't want them to say or you know to tell the police his identity I don't know if that adds up you know when you think an 11 and a 7 year old I, I just think he enjoyed the kill and they were easy, vulnerable again, you know, <laughs> victims. And he took the chance and he done that. Before then he moved on to the next. And there are many of them. So I think shortly after that, because that was in the July, now we're in August. And then he says, he's told the police in a statement, that he's murdered a teenage girl. He saw a girl walking home again. Uh, and he didn't know her name and he couldn't identify her to police he just said that he had killed a teenage girl now on December the 21st 2011 uh, the, uh, Georgia, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation identified her as a 13 year old girl um, her name was Saunders and um, she was a runaway actually from Beaumont in Texas um, in, in July 1974 so really she wasn't really identified until 2011 um, and she was actually a runaway and she was going then to see her mother 
in um, I think uh, Warner Robins in uh, her name was in Georgia when she disappeared actually on the 1st of August 1974 so it, they assume that that was the teenage girl that he murdered now this time though he can't say can he that he murdered her because she knew his identity because she didn't know him at all so I think with the first two girls anything this man says about why he murdered people I think some you can see later on why he actually murdered them but these ones these early ones these very young children there no there is no excuse there is no reasoning because by murdering this girl and taking this girl off the street he took her because she was vulnerable she probably got in his car and he killed her and we don't know what else happened to her because her body wasn't found or identified for such a long time anyway by that time it's too difficult to find out but I think this where he's saying about that he is this oh it was just a you know because it was my identity he didn't want to be known as a child killer even though that's what he was without a doubt the man was a child killer because he's already now killed three and he's about to go on and kill many more people so then we find out that in between this these the children's murders you know the, and the Anderson sisters and then we have this other murder that no one knew about until 2011 yes so on the 2nd of August 1974 after he had murdered the Anderson sisters and this other now 14 year old girl he then met I think it was Marjorie Howie in uh, Atlantic Beach in Florida now she either invited him or he forced his way in to her apartment and again he strangled her with her nylon stockings and stole her TV set so he wasn't just killing these women he was taking from them at least the older ones anyway now Marjorie was 49 years old so this is the difference when we're looking at a serial killer and if you was trying and I've said this before of other cases when you're trying to profile these killers now you've got a killer that's killing a variety he's going state to state really in the end he's, he's done the majority of, of them and his killings are you know if he hasn't said about these killings you wouldn't have pinned it on him because either most killers go for younger people whatever. He, he didn't care if you got in his way or if you wanted something or you had something in your apartment or your home and there was a home, home invasion you was not going to live you was going to die because I think he enjoyed the kill as much as he enjoyed the theft part of it he must have because his, his victim variety was uh, vast really so again on August the 23rd 1974 so we're talking about now only a few weeks he's killed quite a few people after escaping detention I think it's I don't know why but it, this this is what he's done we're about three or four weeks in actually here and he's uh, really going for it now so then again Knowles shows up I think is it um Musella in Georgia and he forces his way into the home of Sue Price or Pierce sorry Sue Pierce and there was her she was there with her three-year-old son. Now, Noel strangled uh, Pierce, but he did leave the child physically unharmed. So he didn't harm the three-year-old child. But he killed the child mother in front of the child. Again, another home invasion. Now, we don't know, do we, really? Because he's never really said when he was given his staff and talking about his crimes at certain points. And you'll see it by the end of this, what I mean. I mean, was it a home invasion for material, like shackle stuff, you know, goods, that sort of stuff, you know, <laughs> personal items? Was it a home invasion to rape and kill? Because this is what he liked to do, to strangle. It was very unclear with this case, and it remains unclear because you've only got his word, really, because we don't know, do we? We know he was a criminal in the theft and part of it but I think he was more of a serial killer than a thief 
so now here we go right now we're in September the 3rd of September 1974 now his MO's changed now he's in this Scots Inn and this is in uh, Ohio he's now in another state of America and he meets this uh, William Bates this 32 year old accountant executive from an Ohio uh, power company so now we're not going to think he's going to kill this one because this is a man really he's killed children he's killed women he's gagged older women so he's now killed a few we're now only in September and now he's met this um, William Bates so the bartender said he knew Bates and um, recalls that Bates was a young like red-headed type man uh, he had had several drinks that evening and they had left together so he was seen now with Knowles on that night now that was the last time William Bates was ever seen alive now Bates's wife of course was waiting at home for him the, the man doesn't turn up she's reported him missing and then police realise then that his car's missing as well so of course the police are looking around and they're looking outside this bar and everything and they saw a car an abandoned car over in the corner because don't forget now Knowles has took Bates's car but whose car's he left whose is the abandoned car there well of course it's Alice Curtis's car his first victim or the first victim that we know about so he's used this car to kill and go across country in different states and now he's took he's left and been known to have left the building with William Bates and now that car's there and in October Bates's nude body was found and he had been strangled and dumped in the wood now a nude body so this man this is what I'm saying to when you're profiling and you are looking for a killer and you have many many maybe maybe three or four young girls and you've got some older girls you've got some home invasion now you've got a killer that's picking up people in bars men they're no longer women this was a man took away abducted from there really got in the car strangled and found naked so <laughs> this it makes it very difficult again if you was looking at this from a profiler's point of view unless you had known that someone had seen him with them you wouldn't you wouldn't have put him up for this crime at all not at all not really or if you if you're going to put him up for this crime because you know he was actually there because he's been seen would you have put him against the other five or six crimes that he's already already done which are these home invasions these women these children no so this man is a killer of anybody now he doesn't care man women children, old people, OAPs, elderly, he doesn't care because this man's going to take and I think he's going to take your stuff, he's going to take you know anything he needs from you before death and then he's going to kill you. This is a pure serial killer now on a rampage. Now now he's got Bates' car because he's dumped his body and he's all going again. No one's caught him. No one's caught him at all. And he moves now to a campground in Ely in Nevada, another state now. Now we all know that in Nevada, if you're going to get caught for murder, you're going to get the death penalty, or you did have, you would have had in them days. But he didn't care because he had no intention of ever being caught, really. And if he was caught, he was going to try and escape, and that's exactly what he was going to do. So on September the 18th, 1974, he bound and shot two elderly campers again different MO totally we've now got two elderly people camping I think it's Emma and Lewis or Louise uh, Johnston their names were they were camping having a lovely day and who did they come across but Knowles <laughs> I, there's no actual real reason I don't even think in this one anything uh, went missing really and I don't think actually in this murder at all in this, this pair's murder 
he was even put forward for this and never would have been unless he had actually admitted it and he did so there was no they couldn't understand this murder there was no robbery there was nothing he just killed two elderly people out camping <laughs> so when you haven't you have a killer when, where there's no rhyme or reason for what they're doing to find a signature then that fits this man in a profiling way. You couldn't do it. You're probably thinking there'd be two or three of these going around, really. Very hard to track down somebody like this, this sort of killer, with not the same MO, not ever. Some were strangled, well, most of them were strangled. Some were sexually assaulted, some were not. All variety of ages, men and women. Very very hard to catch this man. So then again, he's got away with that one, hasn't he, for a very long time. I think that wasn't, that didn't come out till much later about that he had killed them. Anyway, um, but I think later on, when they could look back then at credit cards and stuff like that, the usage of credit cards, Knowles had used the credit cards on different points. So when he admitted to that murder, they actually knew it was him, him because he actually said he used their credit cards and they went back then and checked the credit card. But up, up until that, they didn't think anything was actually stolen or used, really. It was a, a murder and a murder of very, two very nice people. I mean, all these people were lovely and, and absolutely um, was literally just in the wrong place at the wrong time when they met Knowles. And as I said, he was very charismatic, a good-looking man. You know, what do we say? A typical ti what is a, what is a typical serial killer? There isn't a typical serial killer. And I've said it before. You can be anybody, from any walk of life, and be a serial killer. You can look like anything. They haven't got a sign on their head. It's very difficult. And it was very sad, I think, for the family of these people. They waited a long time to find out what happened, really, to a lot of these victims. Okay. So let's move now to September the 21st, 1974. Now Knowles, again, continued on with his killing spree. He was on a roll, really, wasn't he? And this time, though, he'd moved from Nevada now back to Texas. He's gone to Texas, right? He's in um, Texas. Again not a great state to get caught for anything in but he went there there he sort of came across this motorcyclist and um i think it was uh, charlene um, hicks and he again abducted and raped her uh before strangling her uh with her own pantyhose really with her own knickers dragged her body through a barbed wire fence I mean, ripped it to pieces really through this fence and her body was found four days later. So again, the MO's a little bit different from the others. This one was found quite quickly. So, but again, he wasn't caught for it. There was no witnesses. She was abducted, raped, murdered, and that was it. Then he starts to travel then from there to Alabama. Another one, another place. Then he meets a, beautic a beautician, and her name is um, Anne Dawson. And this was on September the 23rd, 1974. Now, two days prior to that, he'd just killed Charlene. But then he meets this beautician. Now, again, it's unclear whether he abducted her or if she actually travelled with him willingly. Or if she was abducted and then sort of become a willing participant in it to save herself i think not really sure what then listen she traveled around with him for a little while she paid the bills and stuff she paid all the bills i think he used her um and i think they traveled together until the 29th of september so not very long not very long you know, five or six days longer than most of these people that that met this man face to face and lived for um and uh i think he claims that he dumped her body in the mississippi river now uh, 
and Dawson's body has never been found to this day. So again, you can't always believe him. You know, we know he's we know he's murdered her. But uh, the Mississippi River, uh, you know, this kid, this this girl's body's never never ever been found, and it's a real shame, really, because again, it's another victim, isn't it, that won't be put to rest, really. Right. <laughs> So we've done September, let's move to October. Now in October, Knowles arrives in Connecticut, moves on again, does a kill, a couple of kills, moves on. Now in the middle of October 1974, so there's a few weeks break, I suppose, from the first one, maybe not. Um, but we do know that this is 20 is told about, but there is about 35 or more of his killings. So he may not have had a break. These may be three ones that's never been found or never been in connection with him because I keep saying that his MO is changing or changes. It's very hard to pin a murder on I mean you could pin loads of murders on this man but whether he done it or not is another thing. I think on October the 16th he entered the home, another home invasion and again I don't know if it's a home invasion to take the, the goods out of the home. I think it's more of a home invasion now to rape and kill. That's what I think's happened and it was the home of Karen Wine and her 16 year old daughter Dawn and uh, he bound and, um, and bound them and raped them before killing them with nylon stockings so he seemed to like underwear nylon stockings he seemed to like that feminine thing to kill with that sort of if he could get it that's what he would use the only thing that was found missing in that home was a tape recorder. So now we don't know, do we? Because as we know with most killers and serial killers, they like to have reminders, don't they? Keepsakes of stuff. The thing is with this being a tape recorder, we then don't know if he's recorded it, do we, as well? To listen back, to relive, to replay, to go over in his mind that kill because we know they love to do it. It seems to bring all of it back. It's a very strange thing to have just the only thing to have been taken out of this home. And I think what this tells us is about this man as well, that if you're going to break into someone's home, now breaking into a property, you know, and, and the, 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 <laughs> the risk you are taking just to steal some goods, this man knew these people were there. He wasn't breaking into this home for goods, and I think it's quite clear, because the only thing he took was a tape recorder. So I think it's quite clear that where he says, oh, I used to break in the home and they were there. No, you're a serial killer and you was breaking in the home because you knew these women and their children who you was gonna rape and murder were there. And that's the real truth about Knowles, I think the Casanova killer. Strange name for a man who's a very sadistic and dangerous man. So by I think the 18th of October 1974 Knowles had now made his way now to Virginia where he broke into the home of a 53 year old Doris um, Horsey and he shot her and he shot her to death with her husband's rifle and then wiped all the prints, wiped everything clear placed a gun beside her body to make it look like they're, you know, she'd done it herself or whatever. But because when the police sort of went in, there was no signs of a robbery. Um, and, all, all, and actually with that, again, this case, there was no real sign of a motive. His whole motive was to kill. That That was it. And I think this is when we look at investigations. You know, you're always looking for the motive. What was the motive? These killers, his only motive to break into Doris's home was to kill her. And to set that scene as if to say, you know, because the husband wasn't there and he used the husband's shot right there, the rifle and stuff to shoot her with. There was no signs of a robbery. What was he trying to do? Set the husband up? You know, there's, you don't know what's going through this psychopath's mind at the time but to wipe it all clean leave it like that and leave this case so open to interpretation really that unless he had 
said about the murder of this woman again this would have been another unsolved case so still driving he was now he's still driving William Bates car the one that he'd murdered about two months prior the man and left his naked body um, now he picked up two hitch um, hitchhikers in Key West in Florida actually and with all intentions and he told the police this he had all intentions of killing these two hitchhikers these two girls and um, but when the police pulled him over for I think it was a traffic traffic violation he was a bit rattled you see he didn't know what to do so he got away with that the police officer didn't recognize him as I say we had so many different crimes going on here who could pinpoint him to one plus he was going state to state to state to state now in them days they didn't all mix up we haven't got like the you know the investigation now that we have today where you have multiple states working together and everything shared that wasn't like that in 1974 so now he's in this key west in florida and this officer gives him a warning and lets him on, on, on his way now this is what saved this girl's life not the officer really but the fear Knowles had that if he didn't get these girls out of this car, really, and get away from there, he then um, <laughs> would be caught. So he done it to save himself. He only allowed these girls to live and get out of his car because to save himself. That's the only reason. He had every intention, and he said it in a statement, to kill these two girls. Now, how lucky were they? So the other thing that Knowles did at this point, because he was worried, he rings a lawyer. He starts speaking to a lawyer. And um, I think it was in Miami, Florida, when he spoke to a lawyer. And then he started writing out a statement himself and saying everything he'd done. And, and the lawyer suggested that you need to give yourself up. Um, and he had also arranged a meeting. Um, but he only arranged the meeting that lasted long enough for him to explain himself and hand over his confession tape. Now the confession tape was probably taped on the tape recording that he took from the Wines house where he'd raped and murdered the mother and the daughter and took the tape recorder. And he then used that tape recorder to record his confession. Handed it to the lawyer and literally left because he didn't want to be caught. So by the lawyer then, had, by the time he had reported it and everything else, um, it was too late, he was gone. So on November the 6th, 1974 in Georgia, now Knowles again befriends somebody else now, another woman, uh, I think as Carswell Carr her name was, and she was, and he invited, she invited him back to her home to spend the night. Now, over the drinks, when they was having all these drinks and a bit of a party going on, and you know, as you would when you invite someone back, um, he stabbed her. He stabbed her to death. And then he strangled her 15-year-old daughter. So after murdering these girls, Knowles then attempted to engage with necrophilia, with the corpses. And I think it comes a little bit down the line about Knowles' ability to have any sexual relationship with a live woman, really. And I think this is part of his rejection and his feeling of worthlessness and stuff. And maybe this is what was really behind all these killings, whether is it a man or a woman. He seemed to need that stimulation of the kill to do what he did. He couldn't have a woman that was a ready and willing partner. You had to be fighting, you had to be saying no, you had to have the fear that he needed to be able to do it. And I think with the necrophilia, um, that's the only way you could do it. That high, that build up they get from a kill. On the 2nd of November, around the same time as he's killing all these others, with young girls, there was a couple of hitchhikers that went missing. Um, I think it was uh, Edward Hillard um, was found in some nearby woods and also there was um, his companion that they know where together and was out and her name was Debbie Griffin and her body to this day has never been found. So after all this, <laughs> you think, gosh, you know, 
we're now I think in what about the 8th of November and now he's in Atlanta Georgia and he goes into this bar I think it's a while I think it's just I think it was just drinking in different bars all around the place and he meets a British journalist see us Brits are just as bad fall for anyone um, and her name was Sandy Fawkes now um, I think she was really impressed with his looks you know and I think she she actually really liked him they chatted at this bar and you know and, and she even says you know he's a cross between Robert Redford and uh, Ryan O'Neill now this is our older generation isn't it we're talking about because you know Robert Redford from Ryan O'Neill I mean in their day it was amazing uh, but for these youngsters they wouldn't probably remember I'm just trying to think who he could be um, look like today but he was again you know a man that was women were attracted to he had this character before he started killing you you know take the mask of sanity off and that's underneath is this man without a doubt so she was really taken with him and again she says you know come on let's go and spend the night together and um he really i think liked her and he really wanted to have sex with her he couldn't do it and he stayed with her for a few days and a few days they tried then continually you know to um, for him to get an erection and he couldn't do it he was impotent because he actually liked this girl he wanted to have a normal relationship with this girl but he couldn't he couldn't do it so I think they really you know this this really I think is what is at the core root of this man there's something else happened here either in his childhood or something that we don't know about and we're never going to know about it really or is it was it just something that um he was so inexperienced and he maybe didn't have the confidence um when it came to real relationships with women you see rape and stuff isn't about sex is it it's about power it's about control we're in a real loving relationship it's not about any of them things and I don't think he knew how to feel really I don't think he did and I think this is a part of his problem here Knowles picks up now an acquaintance of Falks Susie McKenzie and he demands sex with her at gunpoint that's it he must have been so frustrated they couldn't do it then that now he's gone to an acquaintance because again she knew him she had met him now with folks this girl that this british girl that he picked up and this girl escaped actually and she did notify the police and they did try to stop him but Knowles again and this is what i'm saying about Knowles, he would not be caught he's not going to stand there and give himself up so he's then pulled out of his car a sawn off shotgun and to make his escape and that's exactly what he did now days later i think in palm beach florida uh he was again in another home invasion uh at beverly maybe uh where he abducted her sister and stole their car now from there he traveled to um fort pierce in florida arriving the following night he actually did drop off this hostage he actually didn't kill this woman he allowed her to get out of the car without any harm at all i mean psychologically she would have been terrible but physically he didn't harm her so on the morning of i think november the 16th um a florida highway patrol trooper charles eugene campbell recognized that this stolen car uh near perry in florida and he attempted to make the arrest um but as i said this man just wasn't going to go easy at all so he pulled over Knowles, and then Knowles wrestled because he was quite a strong man quite a big man and as, as i've said before he's adamant that he wasn't going to go to prison so he was able to wrestle actually the officer's pistol from him and then again now took this officer hostage so now he's got officer campbell in the car he's got now his gun his pistol he's drove away 
and using the sirens and stuff because he's in the police car he's pulled over another car uh, because he wants to swap cars and of course when you have sirens and a police officer is pulling you over you're going to pull over and that's exactly what James Myers did um, he stopped and he then took the hostages he took James Myers and the officer Campbell as hostages so now you've got two hostages what you're going to do now the thing is with Knowles what he usually does <laughs> is kill them and I think he tied them both to a tree he drove them again to a you know a wooded area he tied them to a tree and um, he shot them at point blank range in the head and then drove off in the car so by this time you have now roadblocks going helicopters out everyone now is looking for this man he knows he's going to get caught but he really does evade them he does everything he possibly can now I think the roadblocks were set up in Henry County and the Chief Detective um, Howard and this uh, I think Officer Jerry Kay actually um, from um, Henry County in Georgia now after this car slams through the barricades to stop him he then escapes on foot he was actually shot I think in the foot um, by one of the pursuing officers now here we go you see all this is going on we've got dogs we've got helicopters we've got police we've got everything else we've also though got concerned citizens haven't we we have people that are citizens and um, the man actually that stopped him um, or cornered him um, on the 17th of November um, he was a 27 year old um, um, Vietnam War veteran and he had a shotgun and he saw Knowles running and he <laughs> he actually I think found him outside the circle of the search so when you're doing a search you would start off with your radiances not thinking that Knowles would get I think further than right, seven miles or seven kilometers outside this radius but he had now this um, man David Clark um, he was an arms civilian with this big shotgun now he knew what the police were looking for and who they were looking for and he found him and then he literally frog marched him to someone else's home and rang the police and he was arrested now that's how he was caught by a civilian with a very large gun so once Knowles was in custody, he did confess then that he was probably responsible for around 35 murders. And I think, but the 20 that he could corroborate with, but some of them he didn't even know. Some of them, I don't think he want to mention. I think there was a few that he sort of said, oh yes, but I can't remember their names and I don't know where I put the bodies and this sort of stuff. But it's around 35. But as I said, this man wasn't keeping count, really. So yes, it was a murder spree. It was literally from you know what July to December that he killed many of these people. But I believe he probably killed many before that, probably quite early or attempted to. He's a rapist. He's a murderer. He enjoyed himself doing it. I think that was his whole his whole mo was to rape and murder. I actually think the home invasions were just a separate thing. Something that he used if he got caught. Oh, but I was just doing a home invasion. Not I'm breaking in to rape someone. And I think this is what it was all about. And I think now the tape recording that he'd done earlier in Miami with the lawyer, who'd then give that to the police, um, have now all come together. So now we, this is the only way now that we know about Knowles really because things are just about to change for Noel, for Knowles so of course he was now being moved to another I think it was Henry uh, County in Georgia for the murder of Eugene Campbell the police officer and also 
the person, the bystander or the, 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 the victim in the car who stole the car, he tied them up and he shot them through the head. So he was being removed from one facility and driven to another by two officers or state troopers there. Now it was stated now that on this drive, because as I've said all the way through this, that there was no way that Knowles was ever going to be incarcerated. He couldn't do it for some reason that he would kill for, for many other reasons, but that one anyway. He just, I don't think this is, that was ever going to happen to him. He was never going to allow it. So now what he's done is, he's sitting in the back of this police car. He starts to struggle then. Again, don't forget, as I've said before, you know, he may be in handcuffs and this, that and the other, but this man is like an escape artist. He can unpick anything. So he's now done that. He's got hold of the trooper's pistol again now. Don't forget he's already took one officer's pistols and shot him in the head. Now we've got two other officers driving him to another area to be questioned over this officer's murder. And now he's got one of their guns. So the other officer, we've got one driving and one fighting with this man. The, one of the guns, I think, goes off. And then the other officer shoots Knowles three times in the chest and killing him instantly. And that's how this case ends. Because that's it for Knowles, isn't it? So, Paul John Knowles. The... <laughs> Casanova killer. I think they've called him the Casanova killer because of his looks and his way about him. And in them days, you know, the press love to publicise it. You know, we like to give serial killers a name, don't we? But this man, I don't think he's a Casanova killer. I think he's a deadly, he was a deadly killer. He, he you know, if he hadn't have been caught then um, or escaped, there would have been many more people added to that list of John, of Paul John Knowles. Many, many more. So, listen, um, it's an interesting case, this. There isn't much history on him. And it's unfortunate that he was shot because it would have been very interesting, wouldn't it? to have had um, interviews with this sort of a killer. A killer with multiple MOs, really. Multiple victims. Multiple um, choice of victims. It would have been really interesting. But unfortunately that could never happen. So this case, all we're left with is the statement that John, that Paul John Knowles wrote to the lawyer and what he told the police in that interview just before he was then moved and then shot and killed on that day. So this has been the Paul John Knowles case. American serial killer. Probably up to 35, probably more. But he is a spree killer as well. If you just look at what he'd done in this time frame from July to the December very a lot of kills in a very short time he's never admitted doing any before but then he can't remember a lot of them we know there's 35 so when did he start and when did it really end we don't know and how many in between all the others so you know what to do thumbs up if you liked it hit the subscribe button you know subscribe 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 you know hit that bell button i think yeah hit that bell button Anyway, you know what I mean by the bell button. You can follow us on Instagram and you can follow us on Facebook. You can also listen to us on podcast in a few days if you'd wish to. So thank you for joining me, my partners in crime. And until the next time, bye-bye.